One of the great things about comics is that they're a relatively inexpensive medium to try out new ideas and keep things alive. And I think that's a big reason why we have so many different comic book adaptations and spin-offs of these big popular established shows. However, one of the strangest comic book adaptations that I've seen has actually come from the unlikely team-up of Hanna-Barbera and DC Comics. At first, this might seem like an odd pairing, but it makes sense when you realize that both entities are owned by the same parent company, which I'm sure you've noticed if you've ever looked at Cartoon Network's programming. Well, in 2016, DC decided to release a line of more quote-unquote realistic takes on classic Hanna-Barbera properties. I've previously talked about how I surprisingly enjoyed the fresh take on the Flintstones, but Scooby Apocalypse was easily their longest running and most successful. I grew up on a lot of Scooby-Doo media, Reruns of the original show, the VHS movie Comeback, a pup named Scooby-Doo, the live-action movie, etc. I adore these characters, so when I saw that this new interpretation was going to look like... this? Well, I was definitely skeptical, so much so that I didn't actually read the series until it was over. Part of what won me over was that the writing was being handled by the tag team duo of J.M. DeMattis and Keith Giffen. They have done some huge work in the comic industry. Just League International, Craven's Last Hunt, Ambush Bug, 52, Doctor Fate, Lobo, Annihilation, and a lot of work on my all-time favorite superhero, Booster Gold. That is one hell of a track record, so it's it's a little weird that even though I've read the entire series, I, I still don't know if I liked it. As far as Scooby related media goes, I think this is probably the biggest departure from the source material that the franchise has ever had. I mean, sure, we've seen the gang handle real monsters and ghosts and sentient computer programs, but how about being the sole survivors of a dystopian world overcome with a virus that turned everybody else into creatures from as generic as vampires to as over the top as literal monster trucks? So, how did this happen? Well, let's start at the beginning. Unlike most continuities, Scooby Apocalypse doesn't start with the gang assembled right off the bat. We start off with Dr. Velma Dinkley, who is arguably the main character of the book. She's an emotionless super genius that's a high-ranking scientist at The Complex, a private paramilitary organization that was created by Velma's four older brothers, all of whom are high-ranking officials in their respective fields. Their initial goal was to try and better mankind through augmentation, but their first attempts were actually performed on dogs. Oof. Or, uh... Woof. The first of this smart dog project was Scooby-Doo. He was implanted with a chip that stimulates the language centers of the brain. And if you're wondering why he's wearing this technology, those are his emota goggles, which display visual aids to help with Scooby's speech. They apparently link together with shaggy special contact lenses, but it doesn't matter much because these details are practically never referenced again after the first issue. Yeah, basically the only real function of the goggles is to give Scooby these holographic eyebrows, which is is pretty underwhelming. Speaking of Shaggy, wow, look at this dude! He was hired by the Complex to be a dog trainer, and he really stands apart from the scientists with his new hipster aesthetic. And dude, they lean into the hipster thing hardcore with this Shaggy. He's quoting Buddha, talking about how big retailers put his parents' grocery store out of business, making sure that you know that he's been to India, and he's also a vegetarian, which admittedly is nothing new since almost every incarnation of Shaggy is a vegetarian because his original voice actor demanded it. Yeah, it's a real thing. Look it up. Anyway, Shaggy is known to frequently break the rules of the complex by taking Scooby out in public. He happened to be doing this at the same time as when Velma decided to meet up with a TV crew as a whistleblower. See, it turns out that Velma is the creator of a nanobot virus that was released into the world with the goal of bettering mankind, but her brothers wanted to make humanity more docile and mess with her design, something that she didn't discover until the virus was already out there. That's why Velma decided to blow the whistle through a reporter named Daphne Blake and her cameraman Fred. Jones. Daphne used to be an ace reporter for the Washington Post, and Fred's been with her every step of the way. They tried dating for a little bit, but that was a complete disaster. But Fred is still hopelessly in love with Daphne, and is constantly trying to propose to her. I hope you like that joke, because it happens non-stop throughout the book. Fred and Daphne left the Post in order to produce the hit show Enigma Quest. It got cancelled, but the two of them made a spiritual successor to it on the Knitting Channel. Because of her former 
hard-hitting journalism and current obscurity, Velma thought that reaching out to Daphne with the details of the complex's wrongdoing would be the smart move, since Daphne is too low-level for Velma's brothers to notice. After the gang was assembled, Velma showed everyone the complex's secret bunker that would protect the higher-ups from the nanite virus, but without warning, the doors were sealed off and the virus was activated early. Outside of the closed doors, the tainted nanites turned almost all of the world's population into monsters, and this is where the apocalypse part of the title comes in. The majority of the series follows the gang traveling from town to town in an experimental vehicle that they took from the complex, a mystery machine, if you will. The general goal is to survive and hopefully equip Velma with the tech that she needs to find a cure for the virus. Another interesting part of this setup is that while the monsters in Scooby Media are generally just people in costumes or literal creatures, the monsters here were once people that were transformed against their will. The gang slaughters a lot of these afflicted humans, mostly Daphne, who, like in most modern Scooby Media, is an action girl. Like, dude, Daphne is a killing machine, especially near the end of the book. There's a point where the gang finds some unborn monster embryos and Daph straight up guns them down. Normally, this would be relatively okay if these were just your run-of-the-mill monsters, but remember, these are people that could potentially be cured. And if you think that's just me reading too much into things and obsessing over it, I need you to know that Scooby Apocalypse also obsesses over this detail, frequently debating the moral implication of if these creatures are still human or not. This kind of repetition in the book is something that bothers me quite a bit. I mean, Scooby Apocalypse is constantly trying to poke fun at and lampshade the tropes of the franchise generally relies on, but in practice, it's just as repetitive as the source material. Fred is always trying to propose to Daphne, Velma and Daph are constantly butting heads, Shaggy is always mentioning his obsession with a woman named Daisy who later joins up, etc. For as smart and subversive as this book seems to think it is, it can honestly get pretty boring. Thankfully, there is one character that always steals the show whenever he's around, Scrappy-Doo. Scrappy is the leader of the other smart dogs that were able to escape the complex, and he hates Scooby because if he wasn't such a failure in the smart dog project, then Scrappy wouldn't have been experimented on, and he could have just continued his life as a happy little puppy. So yeah, Scrappy is literally hunting down Scooby-Doo in order to kill him out of revenge. Revenge. Also, unlike the other dogs, Scrappy has extra upgrades that turns him into a jacked dog man. It's so absurd, and I love it. For a while, Scrappy had these little short stories at the back of each issue, showing him and his pack tracking down the gang. But over time, the other dogs were killed off, and Scrappy acted as the only sort of formal villain of the series, since most of the general conflict was just with these monsters of the week. Over time, though, Scrappy turns into a sort of anti-hero, and he's known to team up with Daphne so that they can go on these monster-killing sprees. It's a little ironic that Scrappy was such a hated character in the source material that he has an entire trope named after him for widely hated characters, and yet he's legitimately the best thing about this book. You can try to claim that there's better stuff here, but you're wrong and you shouldn't be allowed to have opinions. This is a good boy. The problem, though, is that Scrappy's transition into a member of the team doesn't feel very natural, a criticism that I share with the rest of the gang. Like, although everyone was butting heads at the beginning of the book, they eventually started to see each other as family. This is generally my favorite part of a zombie outbreak story, but I never really bought into the chemistry between the characters or even the personalities of the characters themselves. The situation that the gang is in is a lot more interesting than the actual characters that are going through it. This is kind of what I mean when I said that I'm not sure if I enjoyed the book or not. I mean, it's definitely interesting and kept me reading issue after issue, but if I wasn't invested in the Scooby franchise beforehand and wasn't wanting to see how this differed from the source material, I don't know if I would have actually cared enough about any of these characters to like the book if it stood on its own as an original IP. This stands in pretty stark contrast with something like Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated, which both modernizes and subverts the classic Scooby formula. But since this isn't a cartoon channel, I'm probably not the best person to talk about it. However, I think I know somebody that's perfect for the job. Hey guys, my name is Billy M and I've been watching a lot of Scooby-Doo. I mean, a lot. Like Drake said, Mystery Inc. is one of the more interesting takes on the franchise. The Scooby Gang is a lot more than just a couple of tropes and one note character gags and traits. They're fully fleshed out and that's what makes Mystery Inc. a great show. It's super character driven. And while the overarching mystery in the series is pretty neat, you'll keep tuning in because you want to see what's going on in these characters' lives. Fred's weird obsession with traps, Daphne's allergies to seafood, Velma's blogging and 
Shaggy's willingness to do pretty much everything for his friends. These are awesome traits that add a lot more depth to the characters that we're usually not used to seeing. And it's at the core of what makes Mystery Inc. such a great show. Yeah. I think that's what's really missing for me. I mean, Scooby Apocalypse tries to modernize these characters, but they ended up just turning into a bunch of boring, bland stereotypes. Plus, they're a lot more depressing since they live in the world of a depressing apocalypse. I think with just a little bit more characterization, then the character dynamics could have really brought this entire book up at least a couple points in quality. But I still have a lot to talk about, such as the completely bonkers ending of the series. So, do you mind if I hop over to your channel to talk about Scooby-Doo Mystery Inc? Because I gotta get back to my stuff. If you want to go see more Scooby content, I'm sure there's other stuff on YouTube, but if you come across my channel, you should probably check it out. That'd be pretty neat. In my personal opinion, Scooby Apocalypse took a major nosedive in quality once the series jumped the shark. So, the gang worked to clear out a shopping mall and created a settlement there. During a tense moment in one of the missions, Daphne finally accepts one of Fred's proposals, but he's killed off almost instantly after. Then we suddenly get a time skip a year and a half later to see that the settlement has attracted more survivors and is now a fully functioning society. In honor of their fallen comrade, the colony is called... Jonestown. A little weird considering, you know, Jonestown, but at least they lampshade it. Other big changes include Shaggy and Velma becoming a couple and getting pregnant, a random electric shock fixing Scooby's implants and now he's super smart, and Fred is now a zombie. Okay, this is actually a lot more complicated than it sounds, so let me explain. When Fred died, he was infected with the nanites, and they absorbed him into the hive mind, which allowed him to become their avatar. He can control the monsters, and apparently also technology. He has super reflexes and super strength, with him easily being able to take down the jacked up Scrappy-Doo. He also doesn't even need to defend himself, because Zombie Fred is also immune to damage and can reattach severed body parts. While it's framed like Zombie Zombie Fred is going to be the final big bad of the series, he's actually still a good guy and willingly surrenders himself so that the gang can work together to take on the true final villain, the Nanite King. The Nanite King? Seriously? And, and he looks like the Night King and, he, and he's got the crown and everything? Ah! Okay, so it turns out that the Hive Mind was able to separate into two factions. The larger one thought that humanity needed to be wiped out, and they physically manifested themselves as the Nanite King. The other faction believed that they needed to become one with humanity, and they're the ones that infected Fred's corpse. Despite Zombie Fred's strength, the Nanite King was easily able to destroy Jonestown, but one of Velma's brothers was revealed to have survived the outbreak and brought the remaining survivors to his private compound. It's here that Velma infected Fred Fred's nanites with a virus so that he could merge and infect the Nanite King with it. As a result, both Fred and the Nanite King were killed off for good, and most of the monster population reverted back to humans, save for a very few that were immune to the cure. Velma and Shaggy have their baby, they name it Fred, and that's the end. Like I've said several times, I don't really know if I enjoyed this book. I'll be the first one to admit that I'm not a huge fan of horror because I'm a little scaredy boy and the genre never really appealed to me. That being said, said, I understand that there are a lot of people out there that enjoy horror, and I also recognize the long history that comics have with the genre. I sincerely think that it's a real shame that horror comics have almost entirely vanished from the medium, and with all of the legitimately gross stuff and sometimes great art that Scooby Apocalypse provides, I think that it is awesome that this book is filling a long-neglected niche. It's also just criminal that there wasn't a single mention of Scooby Snacks. The official description of the book on DC's official website said that there would be Scooby Snacks. You you lied to me, DC. You lied to me. Now, there is definitely a lot more to Scooby Apocalypse that I wasn't able to touch on in this video because it just didn't make a lot of sense, such as Velma's brother Rufus who survived the apocalypse, and all of the secret squirrel stories that started appearing at the end of later issues. So definitely go give the book a read if you want to learn more. Don't just watch this video and think you know everything because... That's not really how YouTube works. I also want to give a very big thank you to my buddy Billiam for coming on the channel to help out with this collaboration. If you want to see his video where I make an appearance, then I'm going to go ahead and link that as well. But anyway, I hope you learned at least a little something new, and hopefully, I'll see you next time.